Hey, everybody watching and listening out there. This is uh, Justin Rowland, publisher of Cats Illustrated. And we, as a group, the Cats Illustrated staff, thought that we would uh, join 2020 um, Quarantine Life in Earnest and, uh, and start a, a Zoom kind of teleconference, uh, open discussion forum where we just discuss the latest topics, whatever's pressing in the world of Kentucky sports. And Hopefully it's something that you all will enjoy. Hopefully it's something you can discuss uh, and contribute to the conversation at the House of Blue, the forum with. Uh, and this is a trial run, so, so bear with us. Uh, but I'm, I'm joined by the key members of our staff, Travis Graff, Jeff Drummond, David Sisk. You know all of them if you're, if you're at the site. Um, and I'll introduce them one by one here in a minute. But, you know, we might call this Cats Illustrated Television, CITV, I kind of like. But I wanted to open it up, up on the basketball front Right now, uh, Matt Harms is going to be making a decision. I think we all believe in the near future based on what David and Travis have reported. And, uh, and David, let me go over to you first, and then we'll go to Travis and, uh, and talk about what you guys have been hearing. We're recording midday Wednesday. So when you see this, things may have changed. Um, David, what have you guys been hearing recently about Matt Harms' Purdue transfer? Well, I think Travis has been all over it uh, here for the last 24 been, hours yeah. or so. And um, he, uh, you know, started to get the uh, buzz a little bit yesterday that, that this thing was, uh, might go down Thursday with a commitment. And then he's heard some really good things about Kentucky. And uh, like I said, I was, I think like all of us were kind of taken aback on the list uh, yesterday morning, because I'll admit, we talked a lot of Gonzaga, a little bit Arizona, but a lot of Gonzaga and, uh, I think that means Philippe Petroself is, is going to stay out there. And, and I, I don't know if, uh, you know, as it comes down to it, I don't know how much uh, any in, if it was Kentucky all the way, but uh, it's looking pretty good for the Cats right now, evidently. So, Travis, you have been all over it, man. This is kind of – you've done great work for us, but this is one where you've really been way out in front on – on things and I think people at the site appreciate that and recognize that but but just your your vantage point your view of what you've seen as this thing has played out over the last few days so like David said I think we've done a good job of laying out all info from all sides whether it be a smoke screen whether it be like actual credible info anything any slant that we put on this that's out there we've been posting on the board so the Gonzaga I've, I know people close to different programs that thought that the final three was – it caught them off guard. They thought Gonzaga was going to for sure be in it. Some people thought Arizona was going to be in it, but it ended up uh, neither of those teams were in it. And yesterday I talked to somebody, not connect, not anywhere around the Kentucky program, that said that he heard that Matt Arms was going to announce Thursday the 23rd and that he would find out a school today, uh, today meaning Wednesday. So I put that on the board, and then it started leaking. Um, Aaron Gershon put something on Twitter about uh, – a uh, graduate transfer being um, being in the fold for Kentucky in the near future, and if you if you narrow down the VCU guy isn't technically a, a graduate transfer right now, so that would mean Matt Harms. So I did some behind the scenes digging and turned out that yes, it is Matt Harms, and I expect him to commit to Kentucky on Thursday publicly. Jeff, you watched this team uh, all the home games. Uh, this this past season it, it's always a new Kentucky team so it, it's it's kind of difficult to project how all the parts are going to fit together at this point but just when you look at this roster on paper it seems like Harms checks a couple of the boxes that they needed to have checked don't you think? Yeah he, he really does I think there are a couple of maybe style questions to how exactly he fits in to the way John Calipari likes to play but the fact that, you know, he's got the, the size, the height, they desperately need somebody with that and a little bit of bulk. I mean, he's not, he's not a banger by any stretch, but no one else on this roster right now qualifies as a, as a big, in my view. You know, Keon Brooks Jr. was kind of forced into that role at, at the four spot a lot this year, but I don't think his game isn't really that of a four. It may develop into that someday, but in, in my view, he's more of a three, four kind of combo guy. So they needed somebody that, you know, plays like a big and has a little big bit of that big mentality. 
David, when you look, let's assume that Harms is a part of this next team. Um, you're looking at a front court of Harms, Keon Brooks, and then the two freshmen, Ware and, and Jackson. I mean, just on paper, um, nobody jumps out at you as like, this guy is a surefire all SEC guy, but you're, start, you're starting to take the, the look of a front court that would be among the better front courts um, in the SEC and potentially beyond. I mean, what, what's your, what are your thoughts on that front court, that, that, that quartet that we just mentioned? I think we've got to be careful to start out uh, not to shortchange Isaiah Jackson and, and Lance yeah. Ware. Um, for whatever reason, I think maybe they're getting shortchanged in this deal because since John Calipari's been at Kentucky, it's been about bringing in freshmen. And uh, I don't know if, if they're going to be one and dones or not. We have no clue yet. But uh, Isaiah Jackson is 6'10". Uh, he's uh, Eric Bossy says he's got he's one of the best rim protectors, natural shot blockers he's ever seen. Uh, is a pogo stick at 6'10. So it's like the guy's not in the top five or top 10. Uh, it, it, we're kind of panicking and say, Well, I need to get somebody else. Isaiah Jackson may be an outstanding player next year for them. We, we don't know, but I mean, he, he's definitely got the tools. Uh, Lance Ware. Uh, can stretch the floor out. It, it looks like his offensive game's getting better. He's long. He's got a lot of, of what John Calipari likes in the post. And then I, I can see Keon Brooks going back. If you look, and Jeff Drummond's made a, a, a good point at this, looking at EJ's numbers. If you put Keon in and say, okay, this is what EJ did last year. You need to get six points, five rebounds, or whatever it was, and play, uh, be able to defend, be able to play the dunker spot off the baseline, you know, he might be able to do that. Um, I don't see why he couldn't match those numbers. Now, the only thing is, he's 6'8", and, and EJ 6'10", so there's nothing he can do about that. So, you know, I think he could be a, a, a smaller version, but Matt Harms is definitely – something that they need, and that's going to be experience out of one thing. But, you know, you can't replace 7-3, and, and, and he's got pretty nimble feet for his size. He's, he's not clumsy at all. So Harms averaged two blocks per game. I could be mistaken, but I think he's averaged two blocks per game in each of his first first several seasons with Purdue, and that's in only playing 20 minutes a game. So you, you prorate that out. I mean, you're talking about one of the premier shot blockers in the Big Ten and beyond on a permanent basis. You're talking about I Isaiah Jackson as as one of the best shot blockers there. Bossy, other people have talked about in a while. I mean, you could, depending on the lineup combinations, Travis, Kentucky went from a program that, that I mean, they're always going to block a lot of shots under Calipari because whether they have the Willie Cauley Stein or the New Orleans Noel or the Anthony Davis, just collectively, they're going to have link. They're going to be active. They're going to be quick. They're going to be athletic. But it seems like this level of rim protection, just based on the players they're putting on the court, could be could be one of the more intriguing groups that Cal has had in a few seasons. Do you think, Travis? Yeah, if you look at the if you look at the projected roster next year, you you probably run Mincer Askew at the one, Boss or Clark at the two, Boston at the three, then you'd have Keon Brooks at the four and Harms at the five. Two through five can all block shots, uh, weak side or straight up. And having harms, I think I've read somewhere that he altered, I think opponents shot 9% less at the rim whenever he was in, in the game. Like even when he's wow. not blocking shots, he's changing shots. He's making people just know he's out there because you can't teach 7-3. And then like David said, Isaiah Jackson, I talked to some AAU people that think he's going to long-term, he's going to be the best big in this class. And I'm worried, the, the best thing for him is he's not going to be thrust into a starting role probably right away. So he'll be able to learn the ropes coming off the bench, not have, uh, not have a lot on his shoulders next season. And I think that he's – I've heard that he's get, got some stomach problems, and that's something UK is going to have to monitor whenever he gets on campus. So that might be a problem, like, with him gaining weight eventually. I've heard that from, from multiple people. And then uh, David talked about Lance Ware as well. Lance Ware at the Hoop Ball Classic absolutely bodied Evan Mobley, who at the time was the number one player in the country, absolutely threw him around like a rag doll. So he's the gritty low post guy. He's not gonna—he's not a, uh, an above the rim guy. Gonna block a lot of shots, but he's gonna do a lot of dirty work, grab a, a lot of hustle rebounds for the Cats next season. You know, Jeff or anybody who wants to jump in—it's it, kind of all felt like for a while now that next year's team, if it reaches its potential, 
is going to be the BJ boss of the Terrence Clark show. And that's why there was the legitimate, the very legitimate justifiable freak out when there was the G league rumors going on. And it seems like the, the strength of the team is going to be determined by how well the other parts around them coalesce. And that's kind of been the story for Calipari over the past few seasons. They're always going to have the top end talent. The top of the roster is always going to be strong. The guys that you play through, the guys that, that lead, the guys that go out and win games. It's just been how strong is the supporting cast going to be? Are there enough supporting complementary pieces that play well on a consistent basis? Is this, is this the, the Boston and the Clark show? Or is that too simple of a way of, of talking about it, Jeff? Well, on paper, I, I think it looks that way right now, but we know how, how much Cal has, has tried to get guys who are really highly rated in the past to come in and sacrifice certain things and, and play for what the team needs most. So while it wouldn't surprise me if those two drove the team next season and that was kind of your engine and they scored a ton of points, maybe uh, along the same lines, not positionally, but the, the same way that Ulysses and Murray did uh, for the one UK team that they, they played on. I could see that being the case uh, for those two guys. But you're going to have a, a lot of other guys step into roles. There's always a surprise guy, it seems like, with every Cal class who we weren't expecting to, to be all that great. And they wound up maybe being the best of the bunch, a Shea Gilgis Alexander. For, for example, I'm eager to see if one of these guys, you know, gets on campus and creates that kind of buzz and becomes that other guy. But I, I think ideally Cal would like to have that kind of balance that he typically has on, on any of his teams. David, is this, I mean, we talk about this every year now, I, and Kentucky is probably not unique. Every programs have, have ebbs and flows with things they're good at, things they struggle at. They kind of broke the free throw shooting thing last season, but the three point shooting thing is going to continue to be, you know, a talking point until, until it becomes maybe a bigger part of what Kentucky does. And, and, you know, it's just not something Calipari emphasizes. He wants teams that can score at the rim and get to the free throw line, but his shooting, when you look at this team on paper, do you think there's enough outside shooting? Well, BJ Boston can certainly shoot the ball and, and Devin Askew uh, was kind of known of a, as a point guard, with a good outside shot. So, uh, yeah, I think so. And, and, and then you talk about Dante Allen. He, he doesn't get a whole lot of mention, but we know he's got a complete offensive game. And, and hopefully he can start to, to fit in next year, you know, coming off the injury. But going back, you know, when, when we did these tournament games um, in March, um, going back and looking at these Kentucky teams that are winning national championships and getting deep into, into the tournament and final fours and elite eights. And they were, they were shooting six or seven three pointers a game, maybe making two or three. Hmm. And, you know, I've watched some of the better John Calipari teams and I'm looking at it and going, Hey, you know, I, I watched this team this year. You know, we, we, we kind of get down to dumps about it, but, He's got some really good mileage out of teams that, that didn't shoot to three and didn't make them. Yeah, uh, yeah. A, and there have been some point. exceptions. Go ahead. I was going to say, to David's point, he, he's even had some teams that shot it well that didn't end up shooting a lot. The 2015 team and the infamous Wisconsin uh, game, you can argue that they should have taken a lot more. They took five threes in that game, I want to say, made three of them. Devin Booker, you know, one of the better shooters in the NBA right now, took none. So, you know, they're definitely – if there's one team in the country that doesn't rely on them, I, I would say Kentucky's near the top of the list. And if, they you, do. Look, you, know, ahead, sorry, if you look at uh, stats and people will look at Kentucky and say, oh, they're like 300th in the nation in uh, three-point shooting uh, and – I'll look at it and say, well, they're like 330th in three-point attempts. So it's just not something that uh, John Calipari is going to lose sleep over. I think I think something that That's right. Calipari's changed moving forward is I think Cal Perry and the Kentucky staff was kind of a little bit fed up with having guys like Isaiah Briscoe and Ashton Hagens that couldn't shoot. So he went out and he got Devin Askew this year that shot 40% during the EYBL. You got Davion Mintz that's a capable three-point shooter up top, 35% guy. And then you look in the next class, he's, classes, he's targeting guys like Kennedy Chandler, um, Sky Clark, and other people 
that can shoot the outside shot. I think that he's going away. Because UK did not offer Dacian Nix because he couldn't shoot. So I think he's trying to – I think he's trying to change his approach to that. Travis, I think you've been high on Devin, Devin Askew. I think you you've thought highly of him as a player, but you've pointed out that he's not – exactly the same kind of lead guard that Calipari has often had in terms of getting separation off the dribble. Um, And he may have to score a different way, maybe a different kind of point guard. If you really look at Davion Mintz, what he did well, he's not a kind of guy who's going to like really break you down off the dribble and, and, and score that way. He got most of his points as a spot up shooter. And that was one of, one of the things that he was better at. It's just going to be a different kind of point guard situation this year for Calipari. Don't you think? Yeah, I think so. I think that I think those two guys collectively are perfect for Kentucky's team next year because they're low maintenance guys alongside two absolute studs in Boston and Clark. They're not going to need to take a, a ton of shots and they both make winning plays. That's the one thing I love to ask ask you. I've questioned his dribble separation. I've questioned his handle. I've questioned if he's even a true point guard. I think he can manual quicker. I, I think he might be better off the ball. But he makes winning plays and has winning intangibles. He is a guy that you want on your team if you're going to make a national championship run. Same with Davion Mintz. David, do you share Travis's assessment of De- of Devin Askew? Is that basically how how you see him, or or would you would you define him differently? Yeah, and some of the uh, input from from scouts on the West Coast that I talked to that saw him a lot, and I I'd, I'd kind of thought anyway, just watching the body frame. And the way he ran really was a Deron Williams, uh, bigger, thicker guard, can shoot the three, uh, kind of runs like him. If, if you watch him a little bit, uh, not a ton of explosion, kind of on his heels a little bit when he runs, but uh, uh, he looks a lot like it. Yeah, so I agree. I, I think you're a heady guy who can pass the ball, who can run a team, who can shoot it. Big frame, not a small guy. It's going to be different than Hagen's. He's not going to be able to get up in people and terrorize a ball handler. But, you know, he, he's going to be able to, to run a team and shoot that outside shot. And I think a lot of times with Kentucky's uh, makeup that they have of, of, of talent around guards, point guards, that's what you need. And a lot of people look at Davion Mintz and they'll say, well, he's ranked like 38 among graduate transfers. Why didn't they not get this guy who's ranked sixth? Well, you don't need that guy ranked sixth because normally those guys average 20 points a game. And the more points you're going to average, the higher you're going to be rated. That just goes to say, and Kentucky doesn't need that at a point guard spot. They got enough talent. They don't need a guy who's going to – just be a fire wagon and shoot the ball 25 times a game. They need a guy who can get everybody involved and can, can do things when it comes down, hey, now you need to score, you can do it. And I think both those guys give you that. So I'll just I, – we want to wrap this up fairly quickly today, but I want to go person for person. We'll go Jeff, Travis, and David. Um, just a brief summary. Assuming that Kentucky gets harms um, – what does this team look like relative to what you expect the rest of the sport to look like? How do they fit into the pecking order nationally? I'll start. Um, it looks like a team that's going to be a little deeper than Calipari has had in a good scenario. Um, we don't know how deep that's going to depend on a couple of the freshmen and how far along they are, where Allen is at, but a little bit deeper. Um, I think shooting is, is a bit of a question, but not necessarily a debilitating issue. And it looks like a team that I, you could make a case for them as a top five team nationally, but I'm not going to argue if you've got them at the back end of the top 10 or top 15, you know, saying I want to see it. But no question, it's going to be one of those Calipari teams that nobody wants to play at the end of the season. And they, again, should be one of the 10, 12 teams in college basketball that, that could make a run. So, so a team that is worth getting excited about. And Jeff? How would you how would you define this team, assuming they do have farms on next year's roster? Yeah, I, I think a lot of that that makes sense, especially the the part about you know the team that's going to be there towards the end of the season. I kind of feel like this is going to be a typical Cal Perry team where he has to remind us in the media and and the fans and Big Blue Nation about patience, and he's going to talk about how young they are. People are going to get tired of hearing him say we're young, but that's just going to be you know, a fact of the matter as they, they work all these new guys in. But by the time 
mid February, you know, starts to get creep in towards March. I think you're going to see a team that that's up there uh, with anybody in the country. It'll be interesting to see where they start because the, the tendency has been in recent years, Kentucky always gets put based on these recruiting classes, number one, number two, right. uh, number three. This year, I'm not so sure about that. Even though they have the top class, I think a lot of people are going to look at that roster and say they've only got two guys, you know, coming back. I think they might get docked for that a little bit. Maybe that helps to eliminate some of the early pressure that would come along with being uh, preseason number one or number two. Travis? I think you look at the next year's team, they have length, they have shot blocking. Like you said, their only question mark might be outside shooting. But I think that you've got, like I said, you got guys like Mintz and Askew that can kind of just run the show at point guard, not going to be called upon to do too much. He, uh, Kentucky has not had players as talented as Clark, as Clark or Boston coming out of high school in five, six years. And I think that those two – and then you get – Matt Harms is a 7'3", can't teach, can't teach that height guy that is going to just sit there and block shots. They'll run a few sets for him, but he's going to get most of his points off of rebounds and putbacks or lobs because whenever Boston and Clark get into the paint or ask you or Mintz get in the paint, they're going to be able to just get in the middle of the lane, lob it up because those majority of those guys demand a double team when they get that close to the rim. And then I'm really high on sophomore Keon Brooks. I think he's going to be – a fan. I think I don't think he's going to take a PJ Washington jump, but I think he can be a 10.8 or 10.7 rebound guy next year playing the four. And I think if he's the four man, that Kentucky spacing is going to be awesome because you got four guys that can hit a three at 30% clip or better. Oh, hell, um, Harms was hitting threes last year at 30% or better. So he can step out and hit a couple. I think that the spacing next year is going to be the best thing about Kentucky's team. What about you, David? We'll let you wrap it up. Yeah, it'll be a different look. I mean, if you look at the backcourt, it's going backcourt's going to be totally different. Uh, it, instead of a more explosive, we've already talked about the point guard. Instead of a more explosive point guard who really can't shoot, you're going to have one kind of setting the table that can shoot, not as athletic. But the wings, I go back and look and think about uh, Malik Monk and Darren Fox, and, and those are basically the comparisons when you look at NBA draft grade uh, being having two uh, lottery-type guys on the team at the same time. But they're bigger. I mean, we, I don't know that we've seen – I mean, Terrence Clark, just the thing I first remember about him was he was playing up and 17 and under two years ago, and he looked like he was 20 years old. I mean, he just had that big frame. And then B.J. Boston, people are going to be amazed how tall he is. And we've not really had – I guess Clark will come in, what, Travis, six six or so, somewhere right around that range. But B.J. Right. Boston could come in six eight. We've just not seen many six eight guards at Kentucky can break you down. You know, you've seen them they, – they've been a little smaller. But so they're different than Monk – and uh, and uh, Darren Fox because of the size, but and then I have to wonder, you know, obviously Maxi was pretty good last year, and you can make that comparison. But I have to ask myself, okay, how is a sophomore Emmanuel quickly? How does he compare with a freshman? Uh, these two freshmen coming in uh, because you know you look at quickly, and he was dominant. He was averaging twenty points a game in the SEC. So even though they look different. Well, what you get out of them, I'm sorry, will what you get out of them be uh, different than um, what we've already had? And then you get inside, you know, they ended up going last year through Nick Richards on the block. So I don't know that they've got this this year. And John Calipari, if he can, he loves putting somebody down there with their back to the bucket. And I, this is where I think the big difference is going to be offensively. It's not going to look like that next year. So I think these guys spread the floor out a little bit more. They play more dunker spot out of the short corner. Probably a lot of ball screen and, and, and roll or ball screen and pop. And they spread the floor a little bit more. And, and even with a 6'10 guy can jump out of the gym or a 7'3 transfer, 
Uh, it's not going to be two guys, you know, in the paint kind of clogging things up going inside out. It's, it's probably going to be more of an outside in team next year. And, and that'll be, that'll be new for Cal Perry. All right. Well, it's always new for Cal, but for some reason it always seems to stay the same. And if you're a Kentucky fan, that's probably, uh, probably good, probably more of the same. That's why he, uh, he makes the big bucks. I, again, I wanted to thank all of our guys, Travis Graff, Jeff Drummond, David Sis, for coming on. And in this kind of inaugural episode, our experiment trial run with CITV. And uh, I enjoy talking to these guys. We've got an ongoing conversation um, through text or Twitter DM that we, that we have going. And, and I love taking stuff from all of these guys. And glad to open it up and let you listeners, readers, subscribers, be a part of that conversation. And if you're not a member of Cats Illustrated, um, you can use our 60 day free trial uh, details at the front of the site, catsillustrated.com. And again, I really, I really thank all of you for, for being on with me today. And thanks for everybody listening and watching.